Happy good. Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath and good morning. How are you today, Alicia? I'm doing good, David. How are you? I'm doing good, and we have Scott coming. Yes. So let's get started right away. Today's yeah. Sabbath school lesson is Efficiency in the Heart. You guys are excited? Are you guys excited at home? Yes, please come. Okay, let's <laughs> okay, go. Okay, let's, let's go you. ahead and have a word of prayer. Okay. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for this beautiful Sabbath day that we can come together and worship with you freely to open your word and, and hear your voice. Lord, uh, Ephesians is a wonderful book. Paul was inspired by your spirit, Lord, to bring these truths to us. And it really talks about, Lord, our relationship with you and the unity that you want us to have in you, not just as individuals, but as a church and as a community. So we pray that as we open up your word, your Holy Spirit will be here to guide our thinking and our, our conversation, that it may be holy and that we may be blessed through this experience. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's get started. We are at the end of our Sabbath school lesson for the quarter, and we know we are studying the book of Ephesians. What a book it is, right, mm -hmm. Alicia? So Indeed. we know that the book of Ephesians is the book that Paul wrote. And you know what's interesting? He was in prison, yet he wrote the most loving, praiseworthy book. How does he do it? Through the Holy Spirit, of course, right? So let's dive into it right away. And so let's go. And look at this first slide. You, say, you see this, uh, today's Sabbath school lesson is called Ephesians in the Heart. As I was uh, you know, studying through the whole quarter and looking at the book um, of Ephesians, I would say that we could replace that title a little bit, make it modified, and say people of God keep Jesus in the heart. Does that sound good? People of God, like Ephesians keep Jesus in the heart, right? So let's go to the next slide and look at today's memory verse. The next slide for today's memories. Thank you. Uh, go ahead and you want to read it? You want to read it? Yeah, go for it. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2 8 10. Thank you so much. I, let's focus on this thing, okay? This, some of the words here. God's grace is Jesus, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. His grace. Do we believe that? We have to, right? Because we, believe, we say we, we believe in Jesus, we're Christians. But guess what? It's saying something that's really important. Good works without Jesus is not good works at all. No. True, false? True, right? So that is what we have to remember that because we know the word sometimes our good works may not be for Jesus. And that's when the problem lies. So let's go to the next slide. Um, who wants to read it? Want to read? The slide? Yeah. yeah. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them as liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Mm -hmm. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Thank you, Alicia. <coughs> Look at that red, um, red uh, mark there. I know your works. <coughs> Jesus knows our good works. Mm -hmm. But what is the problem? The church of Ephesi uh, Ephesus lost their first love. The work was not about Jesus. It was about themselves, right? So they, instead of focusing on bringing people together in unity, they were focused on keeping people out with the laws and mm -hmm. regulations and good works. Mm -hmm. But what's important here, sometimes we want to be like too complacent with the world, right? 
right? Mm -hmm. So the doctrine of Nicolaitans, you know, that's actually the doctrine where the good and the bad intermingle. Mm -hmm. We cannot have our foot on both. So we also need to, as a church, as, a, as people of God, we need to remember that so that we are not deceived, okay? So we stand firm, but we bring people in. Next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, let's, do, let's do the whole slide. And so basically, uh, the next slide, this slide it shows us that Paul wrote this in 62 AD. And guess what? Paul's mentions Holy Spirit in the book of Ephesians nine times. Holy Spirit is very, very important because he's the one that works within us now. And Christ grants all the blessing, grace, unity, and new life through the Holy Spirit. Um, let's keep going with the slide. There you go. So we have how many chapters in Ephesians? Six. Six chapters in Ephesians. And the six chapters is all about Jesus, mm -hmm. right? So we are learning that everything has to be about Jesus. Let's go to the next slide. All the way. Uh, the next slide. The, not this one. Perfect. So as you can see, chapter one is about gifts. Number, chapter two is about grace. And then chapter three is about mystery, which is church. Number four is unity. Number five, chapter five is walking in love, and then the last one is armed for battle. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next go. So let's do a little uh, quick summary, okay? If you go to the next slide, uh, you see that um, in this slide, we are learning about um, that we are blessed with what kind of gifts? Eternal gifts. Yes. So these are the gifts that nothing can take away, moths or anything. So. What is the one of the greatest gifts that Paul mentions here? Is the sonship. We are adopted to become sons and daughters of God. Can, you, can we really fathom that? Is it possible to really understand no. that? We're, that mm -hmm. here we're sitting here, uh, Scott, all three of us, all of you here, we're all sons and daughters of God. I, mm -hmm. I just cannot think about it. Can you think about this? No. How does it make you guys feel? Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Yeah. W overwhelming, wonderful. What about you guys? Yeah. Amazing. Just yeah. It's, it's just crazy, right? Yeah. I, mean, I cannot even think of it. The problem is because we cannot think of it the way Jesus looks at us, we sometimes fall into temptation because mm -hmm. we look at the things that we can touch and feel mm -hmm. and think mm -hmm. that's great. So that's why, that, that, you know, the chapter, um, chapter one, we are blessed with spiritual gifts that never dies, okay? Chapter two is, uh, um, Alicia is going to talk about, mm -hmm. chapter one, uh, um, Scott will talk about it, and it's mm -hmm. about that we are redeemed for divine community, right? We are redeemed for divine community because it is the grace mm -hmm. that creates the mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. Now, this has two relationships, vertical and horizontal. Vertical is from God, that's grace in Jesus, and horizontal is unity by the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm going to say. Now, slide number, the uh, next slide, the slide seven. If you can go to, uh, uh, just pass this one. And then, and then the next, uh, next chapter three, while he's doing that, uh, the Monday's lesson, we are going to, um, we're going on Tuesday's lesson, that's going to be me, and I will be talking about the church of the living God. And mm -hmm. the church is mm -hmm. a mystery. God actually had this mystery in mind before he even created us. Mm -hmm. And guess what? In Jesus, he accomplished that. But the fullness of time when Jesus Christ will come in his second coming, guess what? He's going to take us. But the important thing is the word fullness of time. Mm -hmm. God's time is the right time when the time is full, right? So let's not worry about when Jesus comes. The question is, are we in the right church? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Think about it. Israelites thought they were in the right church. But when there was battle between David and Goliath and the whole Israel, guess what? The whole Israel was scared. They were not the church of the living God. Only David was. One man church. One man military. Mm. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. So you and I have the power to be one man church, one man military one man army for God, but it has to start today, right? And then you have, um, you know, the Wednesday's lesson, 
is going to be uh, Scott. He'll be talking about the faith that creates new life, okay? And then uh, we will, uh, you know, unity, unity can be deceptive. For example, sometimes we can unite for the wrong reasons, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. what, give me an example of unity for the wrong reasons in the Bible. Can the, the false witnesses by uh, Jezebel that mm -hmm. were given to kill Naboth. That's right. That's, that's, and the Tower of Babel mm -hmm. is the greatest example of the unity. People mm -hmm. united mm -hmm. because they can exalt themselves above, above God. God. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that itself is a problem. And that's when God <coughs> took out the unity mm -hmm. so they can understand God. So mm -hmm. that's, that's, uh, that's Wednesday's lesson. And then um, Thursday's mm -hmm. lesson... Walk mm -hmm. in love, right? Walk in love is going to be based on all the relationships we have because Christ loved us first. We made, I made a handout on all the, all the summaries. If you want to pick it up later on, you can. And then the final, you know, final one is about standing firm in our faith, right? If you look at the armor of God, which is chapter 6, armor of God has to do with, there are seven armors, okay? Prayer is the seventh one. All of them are passive armor in a sense that we don't physically fight. They are to stand firm and stand firm for God, right? Mm -hmm. The helmet of salvation, all this. But if you really look at all these components of the armor, they're actually all Jesus. Helmet of salvation, Jesus. Breastplate of righteousness, Jesus. Right? Girdle mm -hmm. of truth, Jesus. Mm -hmm. So everything is about Jesus, right? And then the one that we actually fight, guess what that one is? Is the sword of the spirit word. spirit uh, yeah so word that's right that's the word sword has double edge sword right mm -hmm. but that's not even fighting it's just declaring jesus to other people how do we get salvation we believe that jesus is god and we declare it it's mm -hmm. in moments right mm -hmm. so that's that's really really cool stuff you know and these are the things that just amazing that paul wrote this when he was in prison maybe on death row mm -hmm. but how does he do it that, is, that should give us an you know, inspiration that no matter what we're going through in life, guess what? We have to praise God, mm -hmm. right? Because he already won the battle on the cross. So in the, in the Sabbath school lesson, there's this Ferris wheel, London, London Eye, right? Mm -hmm. And they said it's like you be on top and you look and you see the whole picture. Guess what? Paul wants us to mm -hmm. pray so we can have the eyes of Jesus. Ephesians 1. Eight. It says, the, pray for the eyes of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So as church members, as Christians, we got to have the eye of Jesus, okay? And, and so, uh, you know, Paul doesn't give any specific greeting in the book of Ephesians to specific people. So it's actually for everybody. That's what the, our as Seventh-day Adventist SDA Bible commentary says. And it, uh, the Bible, Bible commentary also says, says Paul is calling for a unity. Mm -hmm. Why? Because unity is only possible, true unity is only possible by choice. Mm -hmm. If we bring unity with force, guess what that is? Dictatorship. Mm -hmm. Tyranny. Yep. Tyranny. So yep. that is the key. What does Joshua say? I choose for yourself on this day whom shall you serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So this is why God allows Satan and allows tem uh, trials and things like that. Because in those trials, in those temptations, guess what? we can choose to be united under God or we can choose to unite under myself or Satan. And that is the beauty of the book of Ephesians. It is actually the book of the love story of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Actually, mm -hmm. it is the gospel, according to Paul, yeah. about Jesus. It is mm -hmm. the first gospel. So, Scott, take us. To we are blessed in Christ. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and, and I think Christ is the very central figure, um, not just in the first chapter, but in the entire book of Ephesians and in the entire Bible. So it starts off with saying, someone has described as the Ephesians as the Alps of the New Testament. So I was going to give you guys my own story. So um, one time as I was climbing in the Himalaya mountains, um, I we encountered some like a fog bank but as we kept ascending we got above the clouds and all of a sudden like the sun came out and it was beautiful and sunny and there was this vast landscape and then everything that would have been left below was covered in fog 
So you were like just the mountaintop and you and God. And I thought that was beautiful. So that reminded me of this story here in Ephesians, how I think chapter one is giving like the overview of the entire book. And so um, let's read a little bit what the lesson book says here. So it says the scenery. Uh, so Ephesians uh, 1, 3 to 14 functions like a map at the mountain summit that identifies the peaks on the horizon as Paul orients us to our blessed place and the vast landscape of the plan of salvation. The scenery covers the full span of salvation history from eternity past through God's grace-filled actions in Christ to eternity in the future. So let's, um, let's go ahead and turn to... Uh, could, do you have any of my slides or no? Okay, so there's one on Ephesians 1. Okay, well, anyway, I'll keep going. So meanwhile, I was also going to talk about how um, the Bible and uh, Christianity is the only, uh, only real religion where Christ is central. And what does Christ say? That there's no other way of salvation? Okay, yes, that's it. Um, so as we read Ephesians 1, note how often Paul mentions Jesus and how often he refers to him and also the idea that without Christ there is no salvation and man would be eternally lost. Whereas in Catholicism, Jesus is subordinate to the priest because the priest can create the creator during the mass, which is called transubstantiation. Um, in, in reality, Christ is the creator and there's no such thing as creating the creator. So in Islam, they believe that Jesus is one of the prophets, but he's not the divine son of God. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Judaism, they think that uh, he was a charismatic leader or preacher, but not the Messiah. Buddhism uh, doesn't even focus on Jesus at all. They, fo they focused on the Buddha, Siddhat Siddhartha, Gautama. Am I saying that right? <laughs> Most likely. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah. right. Uh -huh. And they talk about the path to enlightenment and the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. Hinduism allows for multiple deities, but Jesus isn't even one of them. Whereas atheism just denies the existence of God altogether. Um, so let's, let's go back now to read Ephesians 1. So somebody want to read Ephesians 1? Thank you. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So please, please note that Jesus, how many times he's mentioned. Uh, so he's mentioned at least three times in the first two verses. Um, then keep going. Next slide. Yeah, or if, go ahead. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before mm -hmm. him in love, having predestined to us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of His grace by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. Keep going. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure which He purposed in Himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in, in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in oh. him. So I, I wanted to stop and comment on that. So I feel like this is kind of the central theme of the, ca of the chapter and of the book of Ephesians, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both 
which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. So that is, everything comes together in Christ. Uh, so he, he's really elevating Christ uh, on a different level than all the other religions and all the other beliefs. Um, so keep going. In him also we, we have obtained an inheritance being predest predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. And keep going. You're doing a good job. You probably should know you said that. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Pray, um, Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And does anybody have any comments on this verse? I think verse 17 is another key verse saying um, that basically Christ um, is the one who opens our understanding and he, he enlightens us with all the riches of the inheritance of the saints. And then we'll finish up with the last few verses. Oh, it looks like Byron. But you, you look at that. If you're in the world, you're in darkness. And God's desire, as he's writing to the Ephesians, is to open your eyes to what really matters. What the real truths are, that you may have wisdom, the wisdom from God, not the wisdom from the world. And so he's literally saying these people have no idea what they're missing out on. So and it's, it's basically even a call to say, so please show them what they're missing out on in me mm -hmm. and the life that I have to offer. Because most of the time, Christians back then weren't necessarily wealthy. I mean, there were some things like that. But in the world's point of view, it's not a very appealing prospect. But once you have your mind enlightened to you, you can, God touches it, you can see what really matters. True, true. Did you have a comment? Well, <clears throat> it's nice to see the contrast with other religions. And that's true believe as we do, but how does that affect us individually? How do we have Christ in us, the hope of glory? How do we have his character in us? That's, that's my thought. How, how do you have this character in us? Are you going to answer the question for us as well? Well, of course, it's by prayer and by studying, by being together like this, helps. Do you have a comment here? Yeah, I've, I've read a lot about the Holy Spirit. And when it says here that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, it sounds to me like the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is mentioned a lot in the Bible with the spirit of this, the spirit of that. And I, I believe that those are imparted by the Holy Spirit. That's a good point. Yeah. If we think about this, fearing God, when you fear God, you're not going to do bad things. If you have reverence for God, you're not going to do bad things. It's humbling you. Fearing God is humble us. If we really practice. You know, I, I always, because uh, we talked about the reverence, right? But for me, the fear of God is this. I don't want to lose the protection of God. That's my fear. Because if I lose the protection of God, guess who gets me? Satan. And I'm in trouble. 
Yes. The fearing God with a reference that if I fear God, I'm not going to do adultery. If I fear God, I'm not going to be with the world. I have reference, you know, well, uh, because God's not going to like it if I do astray from Him. Actually, you're absolutely right. And Satan will accuse us, and God will, you know. So, I, to answer this gentleman's question, though, what comes to mind to me is the experience of Job and the response he had at the end of his experience. So if you read in the last part of Job, mm -hmm. Job, Job says, blessed be the Lord, and I'm paraphrasing because I'm not going there, but blessed be the Lord, I have heard of him, oh. I, I heard of you in the past, but now I know you. I see you. I knew you. And that's the difference. It's like it's that daily submission and living with Christ it's like, how, how, do you, how do you know whether or not the person that you're attracted to is going to become your spouse? If you never spend any time with them, you don't develop that relationship. And Christ gave us that analogy to explain how intimate that relationship with him needs to be. And that was Job's experience. He had, he had known about God all his life, and he had lived up to obedience maybe more so than most people. And he loved the Lord, but he didn't really know the Lord until he went through that experience and, and, and the Lord brought him through that experience. And I think that's what each one of us uh, have the opportunity for. Thank you, that's beautiful. And let, let's finish out the chapter with the next slide. greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in what in that which is to come and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Well, and I think that's also a very significant passage in saying yeah, above, are we out of time? Uh, above every name that is named. So, I mean, that doesn't, <laughs> doesn't leave much room above that. So, I mean, above everything, above everyone, He's, he's better, higher, more exalted. Yep. And that was because he was willing to humble himself to be even lower than the lowest. He, he was even to humble unto death and the death of a cross. So uh, that's how important Christ is to this. And then um, I'm going to finish up with... Uh, so in, uh, in his book, Mere Christianity, um, C.S. Lewis calls him, he, he either has to be accepted as Lord or else he's a lunatic or a liar because he's like, you can't call him a great moral teacher if he's, his, he's, a, he's saying he's the son of God and he isn't. Uh, so therefore, you either have to worship him or you, you think he's a terrible being. And then um, I was going to also conclude with the desire of ages. Um, because I thought this passage was really beautiful in pointing out the importance of Christ. His name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. From the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father as he was the image of God. The image of his greatness and majesty, the outshining of his glory, it was to manifest this glory that he came to our world. To this sin-darkened earth, he came to reveal the light of God's love to be God with us. Therefore, it was prophesied of his name that it shall be called Emmanuel. And by coming to dwell with us, um, to, was to reveal both to God and men and to angels the word of God. He was God's thought made audible in his prayer for his disciples I have declared unto, the, unto them thy name, merciful and gracious and long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. Mm -hmm. But not alone for his earth-born children was this revelation given. Our little world is the lesson book of the universe. 
God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look, and it will be their study throughout endless ages. Both the redeemed and the unfallen beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their song. It will be seen that the song of the uh, song, it will be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is the glory of the self-sacrificing love. In light of Calvary, it will be seen that the law of self-renouncing uh, love is the law of life for earth and heaven. That the love which seeketh not her own has its source in the heart of God and that in the meek and lowly one is manifested the character of him who dwelleth in the light which no man can approach unto. Thank you, Scott. Beautiful. You know, just want you guys to understand that my Sunday lesson is everything we have is from Christ. and We have to acknowledge that. Otherwise, we're lost. Mondays, you talked about relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's about community, so go ahead. Yeah, it is about community, yeah. and, and, and probably you're going to get the most out of this lesson if you open up your Bible to Ephesians 2, because I didn't put all the, the text on the screen, um, and you can follow along better that way. But as Paul starts Ephesians 2, it, it really kind of expounds on why we are so blessed in Christ. So at the beginning of Ephesians 2, in the first 10 verses, Paul contrasts the grim human condition that we experience without God uh, to what God does for us through his son, Jesus Christ. And before we gave our hearts to the Lord, we all shared in this grim experience. It's godless existence without hope and without promise and without Christ, who is our close relative redeemer. And if you don't really remember what that means, I encourage you to go back to the Old Testament and, and read about what a close relative redeemer means. So um, what, it, what it summarizes there is that this, this grim experience is dead in our trespasses and sins. We're given to lust of the flesh and the mind, and by nature, the children of wrath. And so the Bible tells us that when Christ came, he came for the, all of us who were enemies of God. We were enemies of God. And so people living in this godless experience are still enemies of God, and he's calling them out of that to call them into a new relationship. So then Paul goes on and interrupts this dire description of our human condition and says, but God, right? And it's only God who can come into this experience and insert himself in this experience and completely change it, 180 degrees, from being an enemy of God, as we were talking about earlier, transformed into a son and daughter of God, mm -hmm. grafted back into that human family. And, and some of us who were here earlier, we're like, we can't even comprehend what that means. We hear the words, but we can't even really truly comprehend what that means because it's so foreign to what we experience here on this earth. And it's such a blessing that it's beyond comprehension. So then at this point, God who created us and loved us beyond our understanding, he was not content to leave us in this wretched condition. Through Christ, he gave us a rebirth and grafted us back in. Ephesians 2, 4 to 7 states, he made us alive together with Christ. So from dead in trespasses and sin, alive in Christ. So through that experience, Christ's resurrection becomes our own. That's an awesome thought. Mm. And then he, Paul goes on and says, he raised us up with Christ. So then Christ's coronation and his victory becomes our own. Where on earth, in any kingdom, have you seen a king give his coronation and victory to anyone else? They may become second in the kingdom. They may become third. Do they ever give their own place? Only in Christianity. 
Only, only through Christ, yeah. right? And so that same coronation and victory is our own. He calls us priests of the living God. And that experience doesn't happen when we get to heaven. It starts here on earth. And that is what it means being truly in a relationship with Christ where he can transform us into what he envisions for our future. So then Paul goes on to state that this new life we have in Christ, it's not only because of God's grace towards us. It's not of anything we've done. And that for all the ages to come, the exceeding riches of his grace will be revealed in his kindness towards us. It's one of the things when you read through Ephesians how Paul uses such rich words to describe the relationship of, of Christ and what he's done for us. And it's as if words themselves can't even start to comprehend and, and explain what that is. So he calls it the exceeding riches of his grace revealed through his kindness. So in other words, God's character of love, which has been questioned and maligned by the adversary, it will be vindicated and magnified forever by the grace that he extends to the redeemed. Um, let's go ahead and read verses 7 to 10, if we have them. Somebody want to read that for us? I'll read. Go ahead. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay, so in ages to come, he may show his exceeding riches of his grace and kindness towards us. It is the gift of God not anything we do, and we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. This is an important promise that we all need to claim, and, and God asks us to claim the promises, right? We, we remember the experience that Jacob had when he wrestled with God, and he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. God invites us all to do that, right? So this promise of his workmanship being created in us is a promise we can we can claim. The thing that comes to my mind when he says in ages to come, it, it reminds me that if I'm going through a tough time at this time, mm -hmm. that it's really to show me that he has not abandoned me and that he is still working as Romans 8.28 says, all things together for good for those that love the Lord. So I may not see the with clarity the outcome now, but he sees it, and he's still organizing it all, all in the Romans 8, 28 fashion, and I just have to believe that that's at right. the end of time, I will see clarity with him. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. Uh, Pastor Mark Finley summarizes our relationship with God in this way. He said, faith is a hand that reaches up to receive God's grace. It's not a license to do as we please. We are his workmanship for good works. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, he, he's writing from a, 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 an experience that was real. Yeah. This was not uh, a, a euphoria. This was not some theory. This was not something that he learned in school. Yeah. That was, you, you know, the walk that he had, this transformation of his heart, the transformation right. of his mind. Yeah. You know, I may read from David. And for an example, Psalm 11. And I, you know, David in Psalm 11, I'm very briefly, he says, he says the following, In the Lord I put my trust. Mm. And then he says at the end of that Psalm, For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. That's faith. He did not know Lord or oh God has told him. But in the faith that he had, David did just what Paul did. And the expectation is that you and I do exactly the same. David was on around for 20 years right. when he wrote that. Mm -hmm. And that was my point in my mind earlier. 
it's the transformation of a person's mind, attitude that happened to Paul and can happen to each of us. And that transformation is like the caterpillar turning into butterfly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Only God can do that. Only God can do do that for sure. So so that that focuses on our individual relationship with God. But Monday goes even further, and Paul goes even further to talk about what that means then in terms of community, right? Because God created us for community. We read that in that last part of verse ten. Is that to, he raised us up to, to graft us back in to that, human, to that um, heavenly family. Um, so he, Paul goes on to teach that the solidarity we have in Christ through his grace were to live out vertically with our fellow, um, or horizontally with our fellow believers. Uh, through Christ's death, our relationship with God is restored as well as our relationship with one another demolishing the divide of culture, nationality, heritage, gender, and status, and any other segments. Um, speaking to the Jews and Gentiles in the church in Ephesus, Paul states in verse 14 to 16, and I'll just go ahead and read that, for he himself is our peace, who made us both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the, Christ, through the cross. Um, again, we are, we are to be one in Christ. We may be separate individuals, but we are to be one community in, in, in mind and spirit with the Holy Spirit. And in verse 19, he says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So Jesus is building this new temple of believers, replacing the old temple that was structure and ceremonial services, and creating this new temple that has all believers, Jews, Gentiles, as we look at our, you know, our, our um, culture today, any secular, religious fragment, like it all can come in. You can all come in through that unity through Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where God's spirit dwells, right? We remember at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured off out onto that community of believers. And that is God, how God wants us to be. Um, and then in verse 20 to 22, he says, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself, the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. So I'll, I'll close off this section with just you know the thought of, it, we can't become that community if we don't have that individual relationship. And if we have that individual relationship, we're, we're not going to be able to fully operate to where God wants us to be unless we're part of the community. We're all together, right? And, and so it's us individually, us as a community, all with Christ as the cornerstone and in that relationship. Two, two, two quick comments. Sharon, and then we'll go to... We are supposed to be God's church is what this is saying. Mm -hmm. This is saying that with Christ being the cornerstone, we are the ones who represent his holy temple in the end times. Absolutely. Yep, that's what it says. Yep. And that doesn't mean it's a certain denomination. Right? right? So, okay, go ahead. I'm going to adventure to, to make this statement, and uh, I'm, I'm really being broad in making, making the statement. If we're not together as a church, we are incomplete as representatives of Christ. We can only really be truly the unit that Christ wants us to be when we are together as a church. Thank you, Alicia. That was so powerful because 
what we really have to realize that there is no community without Jesus. Do you know why? Because Satan is full of violence. So when we think we're creating a community on our own, is going to be filled with violence. Unless the self-sacrificing God, which is Jesus, yeah. comes in our community, there is no community. Just know that. That's why the earth will never have peace by human beings. We need Jesus Christ. Amen. That's right. So uh, going to that, let's go to Tuesday's lesson. And you already mentioned it, that it's the church. We are part of the church of the living God. I mean, when I hear this word, living God, what do you guys think? Can somebody tell me? Living God, how does it make you feel? What do you think? Well, what is one of the God? thoughts is, uh, I think David used that phrase, talking to Goliath. He's like, uh, yeah, you have a sword and a shield and some other instruments of war, but I come in the name of the living God. As opposed to the stone deities that uh, can't speak and other people have to move them around. Scott, I think you and I are thinking the same thing. We are in the community, right? So uh, it, that's in 1 Samuel 17, 26. David, remember we mentioned it? One church. He's the only church of the living God. The whole Israelites are what? They think they're the church of the living God, but they are fighting. They are scared of Goliath. And here comes David, and he's like, you guys are blaspheming God. What are you going to do about it? And then he tells Goliath, you come with the weapon, but I come with the name of the living God. See, when we belong to the church of living God, we need to, like you said, represent Jesus Christ mm -hmm. to others. Mm -hmm. and, and that is the key. You know how many times um, Christ is mentioned in all the epistles of Paul's? It says about 200 times. But in Ephesians, Christ was mentioned about 40 times. Mm -hmm. Incredible, right? So in that case, let's go to slide number one. Uh, and then we see that, again, we talked about this. Uh, let, can somebody read um, Ephesians 1 verse 22? 22, the one at the bottom. Go ahead, Daniel. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So all things under Christ's feet, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So when God created Adam and Eve, was there a church on this earth? Adam and Eve were the church. Yes. <laughs> so the church has been there. Mm -hmm. The question is, do we go in and out of the living God's church? Right? We struggle that. Isn't that the great controversy? Mm -hmm. Like struggling mm -hmm. to <laughs> stay within the church yeah. of the living God. And so... This is, this is really important because when we're part of that living God, there's this one body and the fullness of him fills everything. So when we take Lord's Supper, right? It's going to be today. Uh, Jesus said, if you eat my body, you eat my body and you drink my blood. What is God, Jesus, saying? That we are part of his church. We're one with him when we take the Lord's Supper. So we, before we take the Lord's Supper, we got to re realize that there's some things we need to work within us so that we can actually go and take the Lord's Supper and experience that relationship that we're all talking about. It is very important. And Jesus says, if you're going to make a sacrifice, leave your sacrifice at the door and go resolve your stuff and come back. So it's really important today for us to really understand the power of God's church, right? And so uh, slide number three. Uh, and then we see that the blood, so we have the body and the blood, right? What does the blood do? What, what does the, uh, Christ's blood do? Can, you, can somebody read verse um, 11 to 13? Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncir uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So, blood of Christ does what? 
Jesus said, drink my blood, right? Mm -hmm. So today, we should not have any conflict with anybody. It's, it's, that's what it really literally means, mm -hmm. right? Blood of Christ brings everybody together. Mm -hmm. It's the blood of Christ is the blood of peace, is the blood of acceptance. You know, you see the Christ, our peace. If you, you don't have time, but that's what it's talking about. It's the blood of peace is the blood that gives us citizenship. Why Christ is the cornerstone? Because you can build a house in a country that you belong to. Where do we belong to? Heaven. We're living right now in heaven. We're in the world, but you're not of the world. So we're not living here. If we don't live in Christ, guess what? We're dead. But because we're in Christ, we're living in heaven. That's why Christ is the cornerstone, because we can start building that house right now, right? And then uh, slide number four, if you go and look at it, it says, you know, we got, Paul is telling us in Ephesians that church members need to pray for one another. Mm -hmm. And that is, how often do we do that? What are we supposed to pray for? To have the eyes of Jesus. You know, Jesus says in the Old Testament, my people are dying because of lack of knowledge and understanding. Thank you, Victor. What, what does that mean? Do we pray for one another when we're suffering, when we have trouble or we're, we're sinning and say, Lord, show them the way. You know, instead of judging, we need to be on our knees. That's the way uh, church members, the living God church members will act. So Paul is saying this church was a mystery. Why? Because there was that separation between Cain and Seth, right? Cain killed, first blood he shed. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Christ shed the last blood. Do you know why? Because after Christ died, if we're in Christ, we don't die anymore. So Cain shed the first blood. In, in Jesus, there's no more blood. You want to say something? Yeah, Cain was the first death in eternity. That's right. That's He's absolutely right. That point. That is correct. Now, I keep thinking of Jesus, the cornerstone, in the sense that we really uh, grasp little aspects of what it really <clears throat> means as we're looking at all these things because it, it's so full of meaning and of God. And, you know, the cornerstone kind of holds everything together. If you don't have the cornerstone, it falls apart. That's right. Barry? Well, and even you look at it, the Gentiles, they were always held aloof by God. Or to, they could not sacrifice. They were always denied salvation. But by the blood of Christ, he offers salvation for everyone. The blood is that key, that cornerstone, as she mentioned. And all of our salvation is built upon that. Even those that went to heaven previously was built, that salvation in heaven for Moses, Enoch, and Elijah was built on Christ at the cross and that blood. Absolutely. Absolutely, that is it. And, and David, yeah. that is in relation to a temple. The temple is key because that's where God lives. And so he is the cornerstone of that house that belongs to him. My heart needs to belong to him. We must never forget that the Israelites were pilgrims. They lived in tents. And for all purposes, when I divest myself from God's church, I need to live in a tent, not in a building where Christ is the cornerstone. Tent in this earth means housing in heaven. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Think about it this way. Why did God love Abraham? Because he lived a privileged life. Suddenly he gets the vision and he leaves everything and lives in his tent forever. If I get a vision today and God says, oh, leave America and go to for and preach i'm going to be like this is from satan it cannot be from god i wouldn't trust god because i don't have that faith that abraham does and because we don't even realize what abraham did and if we realize what abraham did then we would be continually trying to have that faith in god's word right so you know you guys are saying so many things so many things in my head you talked about the cornerstone jesus is a peculiar cornerstone so God's church, it says the cornerstone that everybody rejected. Mm -hmm. Seventh-day Adventist church is a peculiar church. <laughs> okay? So don't be ashamed. We may not, you know, people may be like, oh, you know, these guys keep talking about the same thing for years and then this and that Sabbath. But hey, that's what Jesus was. Everybody rejected him and he became mm -hmm. the chief stone. 
So church should be peculiar in the world, but not of the world, right? And then mm -hmm. Victor mentioned that for time's sake, the church, first Paul compares it to four things. Body, it's like we talked about body and the blood, right? Temple, temple has, God builds the temple, he lives in it. Foundation is through the prophets, the mm -hmm. pastors, the priests, mm -hmm. you know, because of the word of God is the foundation. Cornerstone is the, is the Christ, is the peculiar building materials are Jews and the Gentiles. We are all building. What does Jesus say? Fall on the rock. Don't let the rock fall on you. So we have to come to Christ. And then the bride, you know the story about bride? Back then it was the groom. Jesus did all the work for the wedding. Mm -hmm. so what, what does the bride have to do? Just accept it. Just say yes. Can we say yes to God yes. and his living, li that he will belong to his church? Just say yes, right? The bride, we are only perfect because God made us perfect, right? And the last thing is the military, right? But it is a military of love. Do you realize it's a military of love and loyalty? It's not a military going like, you know, attacking people, other denominations, other people. It's a military about what Peter said in 1 Peter, be ready to defend your faith, you know? A lot of people from other religion, especially, you know, I, I, I you know, talk to some other religion I won't mention, but they say a lot of things, and it got me thinking, and they point out things from the Bible. Are you guys ready to defend God, the church? Because you, I am church. Are you ready to defend yourself, right? If we get accused of something, aren't we, like, going to do fight to defend ourselves, right? But we don't realize that when people attack us, you know, they're attacking God. Mm -hmm. Or when they're attacking God, they're attacking us. Mm -hmm. It's a vice versa, right? And so that's why. <laughs> yes. That we're to study the Word of God and have to be rightly dividing it. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. That is the word. That's a daily. Remember what's the 10% of your daily Sabbath? 90 minutes. 90 minutes daily is time with God, roughly. And then weekly it's the Sabbath, right? So, we got to know why we're Christians. Otherwise, we're not going to appreciate this living God. Why are we Christians? We're Christians because Christ is the one that is head of this, right? And we are Christians because our lifestyle, what we declare, Satan gets put on notice. Mm. And guess what? When Satan gets put on notice, he's going to try to agitate us. That's when the loyalty comes into play. If we're truly grounded in faith, like you said, in prayer and all this, Guess what? Satan's agitation is not going to take us away, right? So, we really, really need to fight for this against this deceiver so he doesn't take it away. You know, the Greek word church means universal. Yes. Right? Ecclesia. So, it's a universal thing. Don't, don't, we don't feel like, oh, Adventists, you know, we're different. We're all the same church, but we're peculiar, but we're the same church. You know, we, God wants everyone. So, we shouldn't be keeping people out of church. We should be bringing them people in the church. And so Amen. my time is almost up, you know, and thank you for that. My time is almost up. I'm just going to end that we're living in the last days, okay? And fullness of time, Jesus will come when he comes. The question is, again, do you belong to the right church? I might think I belong to the right church, but I belong to I church. Mm. Just take out the I church and let's belong to the church of Jesus, the living God. Thank you. And from I church, we're going to move to you church. That Perfect. is unity in the church. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so, Thank you, Scott. Um, so today, um, Wednesday, we're going to talk about the unity of faith. Mm -hmm. And so the story that came to mind that's kind of an unusual story to talk about unity is the story of Gideon. So when Gideon first made a call to fight the Midianites, how many people showed up? 30,000, and then he told them, all of you who are fearful, all of you who married a wife, all of you who um, for some reason don't feel like staying, you should mm -hmm. all go home. So how many people were left? 3, no. I think there were like 10,000 10, left. 10, yeah, 10, so, so it, w it whittled it down from 30,000 down to 10,000. Now Gideon's getting a little bit worried. He's like going, uh, God, um, we, we were kind of inadequate um, at 30,000 because we're fighting 300,000 or anyway, a very large number. And then God's like, no, no, let's keep going on this process. Uh, <laughs> let's do another test. Yeah. And then it's like, uh, all of you drink some water. And then the ones who are comfortably drinking water and just taking their time, he's like, those are not the ones. 
You need the ones that are ready and just drinking it with their hand and ready to go to war. So he was left with 300. Three. So, so that was one of the ways that God created unity in, uh, in Gideon's time. And I, I think there may be an application to today's time that we may be, you know, the Adventist church is like 20 million people, but what is that against 2 billion Christians or 8 billion people on earth? But God may say at some point, you know, there's too many of you. Some of you guys aren't dedicated <laughs> enough. So I'm going to do some tests here. All of you who don't feel like uh, staying in this church, um, you're free to leave. And then after that, he'll be like, okay, wh who are really ready? Then there'll be a, a true sifting out. So I think that God has his ways of creating unity. So with that, let's, let's begin looking at... Um, kind of the concept of unity. So um, let's go at unity of faith today. So is, is there unity in the world today? Oh, let's go to the next slide. Um, <laughs> so there's divisions among the religious and the non-religious. There's divisions among world religions like Islam, Buddhism, uh, Judaism. And there's religion, uh, religious differences even, um, uh, or there's uh, political differences in America, like Republicans and Democrats. There's divisions among other Christian religions. You have the Catholics, Lutherans, Pentecostals. But there's even divisions among uh, God's people, the Seventh-day Adventists. There's some that are more liberal, some that are more conservative. Then there's divisions in the Laguna Niguel Church, the Salajanians and non-Salajanians. You could have uh, divisions within family like the Scotians and the Lysians. Uh, <laughs> you could have even divisions within yourself. And I think the Bible calls that being double-minded. And I think double-minded makes God want to puke. So I pick the green color for the double-minded. So if any of you lack, lacks wisdom, let him ask God who will give liberally to all without reproach and it will be given to him, but let him not ask, uh, but let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, for he's a double-minded man. Um, so unity through faith, uh, only through Christ. Uh, and then we're going to look at Ephesians 4 and see what unity looks like and how we might achieve it. So, um, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And then this is kind of the key of the verse. There is one body, one mm -hmm. Spirit, just as you were all called and one hope in your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, uh, and Father of all who is above all and through all and mm -hmm. in you all. Uh, so I think this, this here is really a, a key verse in that God will eventually bring in the unity so that we all will be united in what we believe. Um, so let's go on and see what else Ephesians 4 says. Uh, and then I think he also tells us how we can achieve this unity. And I think that's through the spiritual gifts. But to each of us was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Um, Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. Next slide. Um, led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Uh, now, this ascended doesn't mean but that he also first descended to the lower parts, and he who descended is the one who ascended far above all uh, in the heavens that he might fill all things. And then somebody want to read um, Ephesians 4.11, the next slide. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Okay, so what, what are some of the gifts? As a prophet, evangelist, or mm -hmm. teacher, or pastors? All of them, right? So um, I think that God does give us gifts that will enable unity. Uh, and then let's keep going here. Let's read Ephesians chapter 
four fourteen. Somebody else want to read verse fourteen? That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carry about with every mind of doctrine by the trickery of man in the cunning craftiness of deceitful party. party. We keep going. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by the by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Okay. Well, so in green again we have things that make God nauseous, the ones that are tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, the trickery of men and cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Uh, that's what not to do. And then what, what we are to do is to speak the truth in love that we could grow up uh, in to him that is Christ, the whole body joined together uh, and knit by what every joint supplies. Uh, so I think... Uh, we're given both the goal and how to get there. Go ahead. So it's, it's like if we are not paying attention to the goal and we are not the assignment, then we are going to be like verse 14. Hmm. If we are looking around and not keeping our eyes focused on the goal, the goal is Christ and his plan for us. But if we are keeping our eyes on the plan, then we'll fall into place with all the other things. Yeah, Scott, in other Bibles, you just cannot serve two masters. Mm -hmm. You can only have unity when you're no longer in control. You can only have unity when you become a bond servant to the Lord. When you acquiesce your own self and responsibility. That's the key to unity. So, go ahead. But that can only happen, it seems, if God's love <coughs> is in us. Yeah. And so the temple that he's building <coughs> is each of is our individual hearts. And then from that we call us you know, in I think uh we probably all experience it, how God working in our church, how God working in our <coughs> experience. If you don't acknowledge it, that's when you're not with God. But the thing is, if our focus on Christ, if we put Christ as our, uh, the head of in our life, then you know God will orchestrate everything, even though the enemy is coming, attacking you. You know, his way is still the right thing. So distractions will come, like our pride, or you know, just the things that come to us natural that we have grown accustomed to. But if at those times when my pride comes in, I twist my eyes and look at the Lord, then I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay as long as I don't focus on my feelings and focus on my attitudes that I like to have and um, my pridefulness then I'll be fine. Well and let's let's um, bring things to a conclusion in the interest of time. So let's skip ahead to expect great things. I want to end with expecting great things. Uh, so uh, we need to have far less confidence in what man can do Amen. and more confidence in what God can do Amen. for every believing soul. He longs to have you expect great things from Him. He longs to give you understanding in temporal as well as in spiritual matters. He can sharpen the intellect. He can give you tact and skill. Put your talents to work and ask God for wisdom and it will be given to you. And then let's continue on. Learning, talents, and eloquence, every natural and acquired endowment may be possessed, but 
without the presence of the Spirit of God, no heart will be touched, uh, no sinner will be won to Christ. On the other hand, if they are connected with Christ, if the gifts of the Spirit are theirs, the poorest and most ignorant of his disciples will have a power that will tell upon hearts. God makes them the channel for the outworking of the highest influence in the universe. That's the Spirit of God. Amen. Christ Object Lessons, page 328. That, that, yeah, go ahead, That's Victor. Beautiful. Very, very briefly, if you look at Jesus' life on this earth, did he ever argue? Was he arguable? If he was challenged, was he an arguable woman or an arguable man? Was he somebody that said, I tell you this is what you need to do? Never. Never. See, this is the secret. Jesus was totally, totally under the influence of the Father mm -hmm. and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. There was no argument. When they looked at him, they looked at somebody that was different. They looked at somebody that lived to be good, to do good, to embrace, to unify. And his life was the preaching of the gospel. We need to be like that. And we're all looking yes. some for, for someone to care, and he was the ultimate exactly. in that. Uh, you know, okay. just where Victor brought up something to be bond servant. Guess what? The good, people would say, why do you want to be a bond servant? It's such a bad thing. Christ is also a bond servant. So I, would I rather be under a king who oppresses, just like what happened to Israelites? Or should the Israelites should have stayed under Jesus' guidance? who is also a bondservant. So it might find foolish to the world that we want to be bondservant, but guess what? God is then even more foolish for being a bondservant. That's why we love God, because he loves us so much. Alicia, uh, Thursday's lesson. Yep, Thursday's lesson. It, so the title, We Are Recipients and Givers of Grace. That, that's really the mission of the church, right? Thank you, Scott. That was wonderful. So through which one are we more blessed? Being the recipient or the giver? Jesus himself said it's more blessed to give than to receive, right? Mm -hmm. So Paul goes into, um, you know, talking about this here in, in Ephesians chapter 5, and he calls all believers to be gracious to others as Christ has been gracious towards us. To walk in love, imitators of God, walk in light, Fruit of the Spirit is goodness, righteousness, and truth. And walk in wisdom. Walk circumspectly, redeeming the time. And if you go back to Ephesians 4.32, kind of introducing this section, Paul compels the believers to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So the main point of, the, of this chapter... Uh, recipients and givers of grace. We could probably summarize by going to Galatians 6 2. Do we have Galatians 6 2? And if somebody wants to read that. Bear one, another. Go ahead. Go ahead. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Okay. Bearing one another's burdens. That's a big order. Yes. Sometimes, some days it's hard enough to bear my own burdens. <laughs> let alone those of someone else. But that is what we're called to do. And didn't Christ come to do that? He, he bore the burdens of the world. And so that is what he's calling us to do. Um, and, and Jesus explains this depth of his love even more fully in Matthew 5, 43 to 48. Do we have that one? Does someone want to read that? You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Okay, 48, are you to read yep. 48? Yep. So okay, the screen needs to move. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? 
Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Okay, so this is a pretty tall order, right? Jesus contrasts the practice of the world, which is we may, you know, we may, we may sacrifice something for someone we love, Yes. right? But would we really sacrifice someone, something for someone who's an enemy of ours? True love doesn't exist without hate. Yeah. Impossible. Yeah. And, and just one moment. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, as we read these words in Matthew, mm -hmm. if today I don't have an enemy, I can look at that and go, yeah, I agree with that. But if tomorrow I have an enemy, boy, those words are a lot harder to s swallow, right? And so Christ is really getting down to our relationship with one another, understanding that in this world, because sin is in this world, there will be division, there will be difference of opinion, there, there will be all kinds of things that we don't agree with, and we can have these clashes. And in the most intimate relationships we have, we can have these clashes. And Christ is calling all of us who live in him to go beyond and sacrifice yourself in those situations mm -hmm. to bring unity back in. Go ahead. No, I was thinking about when Jesus lived in this earth, he doesn't have no place to live. He lived with people. In, in people's house, in strangers. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is, they're probably, their faith must be better than back then than us. If somebody come to my house, I don't know her. I don't think I will think. I remember growing up as a child. You know, we love each other as a neighbor. I can go to my neighbor, hey, can I borrow your salt? I don't have any salt. They will give it. I mean, they will give their food for us if we don't have it. Mm -hmm. I mean, but. Not here. I mean, environment changed me a lot. Mm -hmm. So we, we are supposed to, regardless of culture, regardless of, um, you know, where we live, we're supposed to have this spirit, right? Um, and in Ephesians 5, 2, it says, Walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us as an offering and as a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. So in other words, unity comes through this self-sacrificing love. And it's that type of love we are to have towards each other. So then Paul goes on and warns believers of the works of darkness. Do you have a comment? The Samaritan woman. Because that's really, he, he went out of his way to talk to her. Uh, he must go to Samaria because if that was the only road to go to Samaria, which is not true, that was a roundabout way to go to where he was going to, but he went because he needed to meet her, and then he waited in the time of the day when it's on heat of the day too, and then he talked to a woman, I mean everything he did was outside of the norm, yes. to talk to her, so he went out of his way because of his interest in her. That, 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 makes, that, is such, salvation. that is such a good point, because you know, when we, we apply that to our society today, are we willing to go and sit down and really see a person who has a different lifestyle than us? Are we really looking at them and saying, Christ died for you? You may be living this way today, but Christ died for you, and you are a soul worth saving. That's, sometimes that's pretty hard. We said our journey needs to be just like Christ, sacrificial giving. Sometimes we don't quite understand what sacrificial giving means. When Christ went to the cross, mm -hmm. it wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. It was a very difficult thing. Yeah. He did it because he loved unconditionally. Yeah. But it was a sacrificial giving. I may hate my, my neighbor, but until I walk the sacrificial giving, and whatever that means, to really <laughs> I am not like Christ. That's right. No, that, that's right. Um, you know, in, in the interest of time, um, you know, Paul goes on in the rest of Ephesians to contrast this with, 
the most intimate human human um, relationship there is between man and wife, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And 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 illustrates how that relationship is uh, a representation, or should be a representation, of the relationship with Christ, right? Um, so you know, through through the afternoon, if you didn't read it this week, it's it's worthwhile to go back and read that. Um, but some of these things we read in our human condition and in our journey with Christ, where, wherever we may be at and what we're experiencing may seem so far beyond where we are today. And we wonder how that can happen. And I want to go back to Ephesians 3.20, um, which says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that is in us, words cannot fully express, right, what this resurrection power of Christ is. Paul says exceedingly abundantly. He doesn't know how to express even how great this power is that Christ gave, is, is giving us to transform us. Yep. Um, and I'll, I'll finish with a quote from uh, Rabbi Karen uh, Cater who is speaking on relationships and forgiveness. Because in this world, if we don't have a spirit of forgiveness, which comes from Christ, but if we don't practice that spirit of forgiveness, it's impossible to have unity, right? And so what this uh, rabbi said is, forgiveness requires a decision. Yes. It requires a decision to live with less hurt, less resentment, and more love because we all strive to live a gentler life. Beautiful. Well, thank you. Um, now, we actually finished <laughs> with the Ephesians. Ephesians. But are we really finished? This is a lifelong journey because Christ is involved. Can, uh, can you put a slide for us, please, on the Mrs. Ellen White's coat? Mr. The next um, on uh, Mrs. Ellen White, she wrote, uh, writes in Sons and Daughters of God, October 6th, the third slide. Um, it says, um, if you can get it, um, it says, the powers of darkness stand a poor chance against believers who love one another as Christ has loved them, who refuse to create alienation and strife, who stand together, who are kind, courteous, tender-hearted, cherishing the faith that works by love and purifies the soul, we must have the spirit of Christ, or we are none of his. In unity, there is strength, but in division, there is weakness. I feel like Ms. Ellen, Ellen G. White summarized the book of Ephesians very well. Yes. You know, one thing we have to mention, mental wellness, because that is the heart. Okay, As a, as a, as a person of science, I think I just have to get up and kind of explain <laughs> to you guys real quick what is the real heart physiologically and how that helps us. Here's our brain. This is the top part, the, the one that's the leader, and this is where the emotional brain stands right here. Emotional brain ha creates memory, motivation, and lifestyle function, automatic function. This leader brain puts input on this limbic system or called the emotional brain. And guess what? You talked about it, Alicia. Uh, the, the best way to live the life of, a, of Christ is to do good for somebody else. In fact, studies done that the best way to stay with good mental wellness is to always be involved in helping others. They did a study on so a few couples and the couples they put uh, blisters on them. Then they took one group of couple and they learned to love one another. They enjoyed. And then the other couple, they made them fight. Guess what? The couple that actually you know, enjoyed being with each other, their blister healed 30% faster. Mm. So the power of healing is within us. This limbic system is where this uh, language. So guess what? We cannot separate language with emotion. Language is everything. God communicates through the Bible. He communicates through prophets. 
He communicates with one another, right? We communicate to each other. So we are continuously being under attack for this emotional brain. This is where the battle is. Satan wants to get our emotional brain. But God already gave us what we need, the language, the mm -hmm. Trinity, which is the Bible, right? Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, God gave us prayer. So in the end, guess what? The most important thing, like we talked about in one of our Ephesian studies, is what we say to one another. Because the mouth should be like Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's the power. That's what Jesus did. And so knowing that, let's focus in the church also our mental wellness mm -hmm. so that we can always bring more people in rather than keep more people out. Because there is, the God gave us three commands, right? Mm -hmm. Love God with everything. And then you love your neighbor with everything. And what's the third command? Go and tell people about me. So it's actually three commands, but one commandment. Go the opposite. If you tell Jesus, other people about Jesus, then we love them because they know about Jesus. And if I love them, then I love God, right? Mm -hmm. So, so important. So look at it. Limbic system is the heart. Uh -huh. Control our emotion is the key because the self-control is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Yep. So knowing this, let's continue to be on guard of our emotions with the Word of God. Let's finish Amen. with prayer. Oh, did you, you want to read the verse? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, and then Paul says in, um, it tells us how we get salvation. Go ahead, Scott. Can you read that for us? Okay. <clears throat> that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, that is in your limbic system, <laughs> that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart... One believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Beautiful. Amen. See, believe through the word of God, confess through the word of God. Be on guard for our emotional brain. Otherwise, and that's what our kids are missing, because we have not done a good job of telling them about God. Thank you. Let's pray. Okay. Loving Father, we thank you and we praise you for a wonderful, wonderful quarter. I praise you for all the teachers. I praise you for the people that are listening, all the world, all the community, every human being that you may put us on our path. I just ask, Lord, that what we learn today, we can take one thing that is applying to our life practically. Each one will have one different things that they need to work on. But let's always remember that we are your brother and sister and mother, and we are the children of God. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Promotes uh, the next quarter very briefly. Absolutely. The next quarter, and I, I want you to really um, I do what you did for this quarter. Study as much as you possibly can. Our God is not only a God of love, but our God's character, His being, is a God of mission. God has been in a mission from the very creation of this world and the mission that has changed when sin came into being. And so we are really going to unpack God and you in mission together this quarter. So I want you to, uh, to, to, to really take that quarterly and the Bible and all the rest of information that you can and unpack it. You're going to get to know the Lord well and you're going to get to know what the Lord is doing for you and for me in his mission. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. So there's an offering plate here if anyone wants to.